The Horus Heresy is the hot new thing right now. It's the even more 40K version of 40K. It's 30K. Let's take a look at it. Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Eons of Battle. It might seem crazy to have another version of 40K using a lot of the same minis. The big difference between Horus Heresy and 40K Classic is the number of armies. 18 Space Marine Legions, not chapters. Chapters are about a thousand Marines, where Legions are between 100 and 200 plus thousand. Massive armies. There's a few not Space Marine factions, the Solar Auxilia, the Titan Legions, Dark Mechanicum. I wish there were Orcs. Orcs were a thing during this time period, but alas. Horus Heresy takes place over nine years, but a lot of what makes the Legions who they are took place during the 200 year long Great Crusade, where the Space Marine Legions set out into the galaxy to reunite, conquer, and pioneer new worlds for the Imperium. But as you might imagine, old Horus, he committed a little heresy, and a full half of the legions turned traitor and tried to murder the emperor and take the imperium for their own. There are nine loyalist legions, nine traitor legions, and almost half of them wear black armor. Let's take a look at all 18 legions and what makes them unique, and of course decide if they are hot or not. Starting off with number one, the first legion, the Dark Angels, led by their primarch, Lionel Johnson, and they were loyal. The first legion were the test bed for the Legion Astartes project. And originally their numbers swelled enormously compared to the other legions where they might have, you know, 20, 30, 40 space marines. They had hundreds and they were, and as all the other legions were sent out to colonize, to reclaim and recapture worlds, the first legion was stuck fighting horrible Xenos and monsters. They were nuking planets, using all sorts of arcane, evil technology to wipe these planets clear of life and make them fit for conquest. The, the, the first legion was very, very powerful, but their numbers were quickly dwindling. And it almost seemed like they were going to be ground down to nothing until the return of the lion. In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. The lion was was an important thing to happen to the Legion, but the lion was not a brilliant auditor. He was not nice. He was very stern and very strict, but he brought a good amount of discipline to his Legion. The first Legion was doctrined by the Hexagrammaton, broken into the six wings, the Deathwing, Ravenwing, Dreadwing, Firewing, Ironwing, and Stormwing. Some of these wings still exist in modern 40K. And Lion, the Lion kept most of this, but he also introduced his own knightly nobility. In Caliban, the place where he grew up, everything was organized. It was basically a feudal Knights of the Round Table type situation, and he brought that into the Legion. He actually fought every captain in single combat to prove his worthiness. And all of the first legion solemnly took their place as his sons. When the lion returned to Caliban with his legion, he brought all of the knights of Caliban into the Astartes. The ones who were young enough took the implants and became full battle brothers. And even the old farts, uh, they got surgeries and special, special prosthetic suits to turn them into almost Astartes. And the first to undergo this process was Luther, the lion's best friend and confidant. And Luther, when he saw the first legion descending upon their jump packs, he proclaimed that they looked like dark angels and the name stuck. As they set out on their galactic conquest, the lion decided to have Luthor and a group of the dark angels return to Caliban to safeguard it. More on them in a little bit. The Dark Angels, under the tutorage of the Lion, turned out to be a very efficient and powerful fighting force, making great swaths across the galaxy with their dark green armor. And when they returned to Caliban, they were met with gunfire because Luthor and the remaining Space Marines had turned heretic. They had gone mad and they hated the Legion that left them behind. And when Lionel Johnson joined the fight and met Luthor in single combat, Luthor struck him down. And then Luther was thrown in a stasis tube and he is still alive in the 41st millennia. And that is why the, the Dark Angels are such sneaky little gits. A pretty good story, but I don't know if it's hot. Number two, the second legion is unknown. All records of them have either been forgotten or purged. Number three, the Emperor's children led by the Primarch Fulgrim and they would turn traitor. The Emperor's children were his ambassadors, his favored sons. So prestigious were they that they wore the Palatine Aquila. 
which no one exactly knows what the Palatine Aquila looks like. I mean, there are miniatures, but it seems to just be a normal Aquila with slightly curved upturned wings and possibly lightning bolts, a holdover from some of the designs from the Unification Wars of Terra. They were the Emperor's messenger boys, and they took a lot of pride in being so worthy of receiving the Emperor's words, and they would stop at nothing to make sure that those orders were received by the respective legions. They were clad in the lacquer of Imperial Purple with gold trim, and they were the symbol of all the Imperium stood for. They had a lot of pride. Pride was kind of their thing. And they, even though, even before they met Fulgrim, they were very much the perfectionist legion. They loved, they loved to be perfect in all things, almost to an obsession. And that definitely was made worse by Fulgrim. But before they met their Primarch, disaster struck their legion. The ship carrying the precious gene seed, the material used to create more space marines, crashed or was lost or was sucked into the warp. It never, it never arrived to them. Luckily, they still had the gene bank stored on Terra for just such an occasion, but disaster struck again when a mysterious plague ravaged just the Emperor's children's gene seed. There is lots of smatterings of that this is perhaps some sort of a covert operation, but whatever the case may be, the Emperor's children had no gene seed and so were slowly being whittled down, only able to replenish their gene stock from taking it from dead brothers. But if you can imagine, Space Marines are in pretty rough combat, and so you can't always get that gene seed back. You know, if you take if you take a las bolt straight through the sternum, you're not gonna be able to get that seed out of there. And so they were in pretty rough shape. Still the perfectionists as always, the shiny example of the Empire, but their numbers were few. And then they met Fulgrim. And Fulgrim definitely re-solidified their belief in perfection and that they were the favored sons. The Emperor's own children, the best of the best. And when Fulgrim met them, this got dialed up to 11. They demanded perfection in all forms, combat, artistic skills. Anytime any of them would receive honors, all the rest of them would hate them because they were not given the same honors. Even when other legions would have great accolades and accommodations given to them, the Emperor's children would be upset with themselves, distraught that they were not, that they were not good enough to have received those honors instead. And all this ended in tons and tons and tons of basically coke and blow. They went mad with this constant need for perfection. They, they, their armor became more broke and crazy. It turned a bright shade of pink, ugly, obnoxious colors. All they wanted was more and more and more, and it all, it all went downhill. Pride cometh before the fall. They were glory seekers, doing rails of warp dust and fighting each other in honor duels. They were the best swordsmen in the Imperium, but I mean, that doesn't do you much good to fight each other. And by the time they were ready to siege Terra with the other traitor legions, while the other legions were fighting for their honor and their right to rule the Imperium as they saw fit, the Thousand Sons were just ransacking the civilian sectors, driving around, doing crazy things, donuts in the parking lot, more hookers and blow. Yeah, the, uh, the Emperor's children really had a pretty dramatic fall from grace. Of course, they, they demanded perfection of themselves, but then their, their pride was their undoing. Pretty hot, though. Number four, the Iron Warriors. Led by Perturabo, and they would turn traitor. Artillery, attrition, a bleak resignation for battlefield losses, the Iron Warriors were a blunt weapon of war. With dull gunmetal armor, they were completely humorless. They fought battles and won them, siege masters all, but they were not artful in war, just practical. Even a little expendable. And it's difficult to tell if this was by design or if it was down to their, their nature, their personality or lack thereof. The Iron Warriors fought war as a numbers game, taking no pride in battle honors. To them, it was just, it was just war, it was just their fight. But they were darn good at it. They would take on all of the battles that nobody else would want to fight. Miserable, long, protracted campaigns. Just the worst possible fighting. But they didn't really care because to them, war, it wasn't fun. It was just what was expected, what was meant to be. And so they just, they just ground away. And 
From the outside looking in, they were an excellent legion. They almost never lost. They were they had a wonderful battlefield campaign record. They were crushing it, but taking absolutely no joy in doing so. And all of this was probably made worse by the discovery of Perturabo, their Primarch. When Perturabo showed up, he was very unimpressed. Although his legion was arguably the finest with a long history of perfect service, he made every squad beat one of their compatriots to death to prove that failure would not be tolerated. What the Iron Warriors probably needed was a little bit of a pick-me-up, someone to show them that there was a point to what they were doing and that it wasn't just misery, but that was not Portorabo. Things went on as usual with them taking being the battering ram of the Great Crusades. No honors, no accolades, just numbers. Every soldier a calculation applied to achieve victory. The Iron Warriors were the machines of war. But without any real identity, they were easily exploited, and the misery of their job took a toll and it led to resentment. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The Iron Warriors felt that they had been taken advantage of, and to an extent they were. To an extent, all of the legions were taken advantage of. They were built to serve a purpose, and because the Iron Warriors had served such a miserable purpose, they were ripe, ripe for heresy and they turned traitor. They probably didn't want to fight alongside the Chaos Gods, but they definitely wanted a change. They wanted some way to actually have an identity, to have something worth fighting for that they didn't find fighting for the Empire. Yeah, pretty sad and kind of hot. Number five, the White Scars, led by Primarch Jagatai Khan, who would remain loyal. One of the very first Space Marines deployed on Earth as a swift assault force, pioneers and outriders. They would fight not as a legion, but as small bands of warriors, small units fighting alone. And they were wildly effective. They were excellent strike forces, moving quickly and striking hard. But this was not sustainable, and other Primarchs suggested that they would be ground down to nothing. It was they were good at what they did, but without that legion coherency, there wasn't a lot going on with them. And they were very vicious. But luckily, the Khan arrived. Jagatai was a great leader and warrior, and more important than any of that, he was confident and secure. When he met the Emperor, he accepted his role in the Great Crusade, but bargained his service for leaving his homeworld Chagoras alone. No imperial industrialization. These deep ties to his culture drove him to reinvent his legion the Khan, into Khans and Brotherhoods. He never met his legion one-on-one, -on -one, but instead would visit each isolated force and teach them his ways, and imparting the warrior spirit into their doctrines. This made them warlike and outsiders amongst the legions, but instead of becoming disillusioned, he kept them strong in spirit. The Khan reinvented the White Scars, and he made them a lot better for it. Where before they were they were powerful warriors with, with a, a, a need for speed, Jagatai Khan gave them the structure that they needed, the discipline, the focus to be a very, very powerful and effective force. And although everybody was a little nervous about the Khan because he was very friendly with the Primarchs that would later turn traitor, he never faltered and the, and the Legion persevered because of it. There's definitely a trend with the Legions. All of the Legions are kind of very similar, but either being perfected or destroyed based on their Primarch. And Jagatai definitely kept them strong, a reliable man who kept the White Scars great. There's a lot to like about the White Scars, but unfortunately their armor is white and hard to paint, so not hot. Number six, the Space Wolves, led by Primarch Lehman Russ and loyal to a fault. The Space Wolves were all about complete destruction, drop potting into battle, like hundreds of drop pods and just destroying everything and anyone in their path. The Marines were not warriors but executioners with impossibly fast reaction times and tough even by the standards of the Space Marines. Their fighting style was very similar to the Lunar Wolves, Horus' legion, but where the wolves were described as a perfect spear tip and assaulting army, the Space Wolves were described as a raging fire, just burning and destroying everything. And this was probably by design. The Emperor created all the legions unique, probably so that he would have the perfect tool for any particular engagements. And the Space Wolves were his violent tool. The Space Wolves were pretty much uncontrollable and unmanageable until Lehman Russ was discovered. 
although he was a little bit more of a tyrant than a leader, and some of the more harsh Primarchs spelt the doom for their legions, Russ actually brought stability to the Sixth Legion. Fixing their gene flaws and his tactical brilliance focused the Space Wolves into the ultimate fighting force. But they were still the Emperor's beat stick, his weapon, and this was shown when the Emperor demanded that the Space Wolves bring Magnus before him. Magnus had broken his promise to not use warp and he had tried to get a message to the Emperor, but the Emperor wanted, wanted a reckoning. And it's, it's probably very true that if Magnus had been brought before the Emperor like was demanded, that the whole Horus heresy could have been avoided. But unfortunately, old Horus, old Sneaky Pete Horus, he was able to convince Russ that actually Magnus should be killed and the Thousand Suns destroyed. And the Space Wolves did it. They, they, they didn't end up killing Magnus, but they did destroy pa Prospero and absolutely just wreck everything. And although later they did find out that they had been tricked, it definitely was a very, very bloody display of what they were meant to do, which was absolutely demolish and destroy. The Space Wolves were the exception to the rule for the Space Marines, where the Space Marines were honorable and noble. The Space Wolves wore a rout, a pack of animals and they stood apart from the other legions. The Space Wolves were furries, so not hot? Number seven, the Imperial Fists, led by the Primarch Rogel Dorn, and they're loyal. Clad in bright yellow armor, they stand apart from the other Space Marine legions in that, although they are great warriors, all the legions are great warriors, they are fortress builders. Stoic, taciturn, pragmatic, not friendly, but certainly not evil or sadistic. They do what must be done, and is a shining example of what the legions could have and probably should have been. Where other legions would ravage and conquer, the Imperial Fists would take and fortify, building infrastructure and defenses so that any planet they conquered remained conquered, and was ready to become a part of the Emperor's Imperium. They were wall builders. When the Crusade found Dorne, he had already established a multi-planet spanning empire, emotionless and brutal, disciplined and blunt, he didn't make friends easily, but was a respected warrior in general, and his identity certainly found itself a home in the Legion. They were practically boring in their organization, efficient. They were good. During the Horus Heresy, the Imperial Fist created the defenses for Terra and the surrounding systems. They created a galaxy of fortresses and fortifications, and even though the Loyalists were super outnumbered by the traitors at the Battle for Terra, they put up a very good fight, and most of that was down to the Imperial Fists and Rogel Dorn. Careful strength and endurance is the name of the game for this Legion, and it what makes them a great Legion. But not a hot one. Number 8, the Night Lords, led by Primarch Conrad Kurz, and they would become traitors. The Terror Troops, pale, serious, and gruesome, convinced of moral absolutism, a bunch of evil Batmans, basically. The forces of the Astartes were broken out into roles that suited them. The Imperial Fists were the wall makers, the Space Wolves were the destroyers, and the Night Lords were a threat. And it was arguably effective. The Night Lords would do, would do small, gruesome, violent battles in order to pacify a civilization quickly. And maybe it's a good idea? Is it better to flay a million to obtain the unanimous surrender of billions? Possibly, but I don't know if fear is an effective motivator. In fact, there's kind of proof that this idea doesn't work in the story of Primarch Conrad Kurz. Kurz grew up on the miserable planet Nostromo, and instead of becoming ruler of it, which he easily could have done, instead he became the Night Hunter, an unseen presence over the planet, brutally and sadistically punishing any and all wrongdoing in order to turn it into a pacified society, where no one dared do anything wrong for fear of the Night Hunter. And it worked! Up until a point. In fact, it worked up until the exact moment where Conrad left the planet and then it immediately backslided back into misery. Kurz was a bad influence on his legion. They had a lot in common, but they hated him and he hated them. By the time the Horsey began, the Night Lords were already gone. They were just a band of raiders doing anything they liked, fighting brutal, unethical wars and casually destroying Kurz's homeworld. They were cowards and they displayed grisly trophies, which was outwardly meant to uh, to intimidate their adversaries, but really, they just liked it. They liked to be bad. The Night Lords were very different from the other legions. Where the other legions were built on duty and honor, the Night Lords were built on fear, threats, and promises of favor. 
If the Emperor succeeded, there would be no place left in the galaxy for the Night Lords. And so they didn't really turn traitor. They just took the path of least resistance. When Horus offered them, uh, offered them the heresy of going against the Emperor, there was no real chance of them not accepting. They were, they were pretty much already lost. And all this might sound like they're just a disaster of a legion, and they were, but it's also really unique and interesting, and also very hot. Number nine, the Blood Angels, led by Sanguinius and absolutely loyal. Although in the beginning, the Blood Angels were a very violent and vicious order, often succumbing to just absolute rage fests. They were the bloody hand and they made great use of the implant known as the Omophagia, also known as the Remembrancer. It lets a Marine gain intelligence of a person by eating their corpse. And the Blood Angels took this to the next level, eating their leaders to become them, taking on their knowledge, name, and rank, effectively becoming them. There often in the Legion, there would be figures, important figures, and these would be Effectively the same person, but multiple people would take them on. Very grisly and gruesome and kind of awful. The Blood Angels were kind of known for being a little or a lot evil. But luckily, Sanguinius showed up. Just like Jagatai, he swore his allegiance to the Emperor to spare his planet Baal Secundus from being, being kind of swept up in the Imperium. And the thing about Sanguinius was he was a great leader and incredibly humble. And this is kind of what allowed him to save his legion. When he met his legion, he swore his allegiance to these warriors, which made them love him. He turned this legion around, picking battles that would test them, but give them the opportunity to let reason and tactics win out over bloodshed and fury. He saw a lot of himself in them and he gave them the same trials that had saved him from the descent into bloodlust, and they became a wildly respected chapter. They were so good at this point, conquering their inner demons, that even when Horus tricked them into a long campaign against the blood-crazed demons of Korn, they prevailed and came out strong. Even after the death of Sanguinius by Horus, the Blood Angels remained strong, keeping their rage and bloodlust inside, a quiet internal struggle that makes the Blood Angels stronger, not weaker and they are total hotties. Number 10, the Iron Hands, led by Primarch Ferris Manus, loyal. The Iron Hands were machines of war and had very close ties with the Adeptus Mechanicus. They followed a lot of the same beliefs as the Adeptus Mechanicus, a, a love of technology and machine. Seeing the machine as something perfect where, where flesh could be a little on the weak side. The Iron Hands had a hatred of weakness. They demanded perfection of themselves, a lot like the Emperor's children. In fact, Ferris Manus was best friends with Fulgrim, and, and they had a lot of similarities, although they were kind of in opposite directions. Where the Emperor's children were very artistic and perfe perfect in combat, the Iron Hands were strong and powerful of will, and these best friends would actually meet in combat. Fulgrim beheaded Ferris Manus right in front of his entire legion at the drop site massacre to kick off the Horus Heresy, and the Iron Hands took it really, really hard. Because for all of their love of strength and determination and machine and power, the Iron Hands were a very emotional chapter, and it's this emotion that kind of led to their undoing. Upon seeing the death of their Primarch, they were shattered, breaking off into many different factions who all took it upon themselves and their pride and their ego. It led to them forming these small sub-factions, all believing that they were the correct, they were putting their chapter on the correct course, where in reality, they should have all banded back together, back into a legion to fight the horrible traitors. The Iron Hands, along with some of the other legions, are a great example of the tragedy of the Horus Heresy. It's a civil war, and it really shows that although all of these warriors were designed to do specific tasks, when they were met with opposition, when they were met with very human problems and emotions, that led to the undoing of a lot of legions. And the Iron Hands were no different. And they weren't very hot. Almost nothing is known about the 11th Legion. The only fact that remains is that she loved our Patreon. We have a Miniature of the Month Club with STLs and physical models and lots and lots of high quality terrain STLs hosted by Comics, Games, and Things. 
We also have viewer model critique videos, a weekly live hobby hangout, and more. It's the best way to support us, so head on over to Patreon to get even more access to Eons of Battle. We also have merch, link in the description. Number 12, the World Eaters, led by Angron, and they would turn traitor. The World Eaters were the shock troops, the best, most aggressive Marines. They were the exterminators. If they were deployed to a battlefield, that meant no quarter would be given. They were the gore-soaked hounds, masters of close quarter combat, incredibly violent and fast. There's a pre-heresy story of the World Eaters where they were tasked with putting down a prison calling and uprising. Three million prisoners in revolt. The World Eaters landed and in five hours, there were no prisoners. They were all, they had killed them all. Which is crazy, that's like 10,000 confirmed kills a minute. But that was the World Eaters, just violence incarnate. And all of this was made worse by the discovery of Angron. Angron? Angry? Coincidence? Or brilliant writing? What the World Eaters really needed was they needed a Primarch like Sanguinius. Someone to see the flaws and be able to transform it into a, a pro, but Angron was a mad Primarch. Angron was raised on the world of Nuceria as a slave warrior, driven by a cybernetic cranial implant called the Butcher's Nails into savage bouts of uncontrollable violence for the entertainment of the masses. When he joined the Legion, the World Eaters were already aggressive and competitive, and their great flaw was idolizing their mad Primarch. Angron had the Butcher's Nails implanted into all of the World Eaters to increase their savagery and Angron's men loved him. They fought harder, bloodier, more aggressively to try and gain his respect. It basically sealed their fate as mindless warriors. Angron's life began as a gladiatorial slave, fighting viciously for masters he didn't care about, and that was kind of the ultimate fate of his legion. To be agentless fighters for the Emperor, then Angron, then Horus, then for violence itself and the Chaos Gods. It's a real bummer. It's a little hot though. Number 13, the Ultramarines, led by Rebute Gilliman and of course, Loyal. 13, an unlucky number and perhaps a bad omen for things to come. And it was not helped that the Ultramarines were created very late and their numbers were recruited from the remaining warriors of systems that had been nearly annihilated during unification. They were tough, known as the Warborn. And you'd think that all of these remaining, these remaining kind of refugees of their civilizations shoved together into one legion would lead to a lot of infighting, but actually they had a marked tendency towards cohesion and an adoption of hierarchy. They had a pathological dedication to the achievement of their assigned goals. They also had their pride, but they were able to guard it well. Where some of the other legions were torn apart by it, they were able to keep it in check. And this is especially true when Rebute Gilliman showed up. Rebute Gilliman was a genius. When he conquered a world, he would make sure that it was completely self-sustaining. A lot like Dorne, but Dorne would just build castles and protection. Gilliman would create trade routes and organization and infrastructure that would allow the planet to remain and be prosperous. And often, uh, members of the Ultramarines would be detached into cadres of warriors to act as provisionists and disciplinarians if needed, handing out final justice and helping out where needed inspiring bravery from the front lines. And this was considered poor form by the other legions who considered it a waste of the Astartes' abilities. But it was probably good to kind of let people know that the Space Marines were a good thing. The Ultramarines would engage in open rivalry of achievement with the legions that they fought alongside, especially those that already had their Primarchs. And they would also paint symbols on their shoulder pad to mark their achievements. Where other chapters, the Emperor's Children, would create these beautiful works of art and decorate and adorn themselves, the Ultramarines kept it simple, painting symbols on other shoulder pads to mark achievements. Their style of warfare was to avoid casualties. They took pride in achieving their strategic goals with minimum casualties and collateral damage. Their goal was self-sustaining power from conquest, order, and expansion, and in all regards, they were a perfect Space Marine Legion. Not very hot. Number 14, the Death Guard led by Mortarion and they would become traitors. Although not by choice, survival, endurance, and stubborn defense, the Death Guard took great pride in their general resistance to mortality. They were known as the Dusk Raiders for attacking at dusk when their enemies would be disoriented by the change in light. The Death Guard are crazy survivable and incredibly tough and very loyal. 
So loyal, in fact, that a third of the Death Guard remained loyal to the Emperor and were slaughtered at the start of the Horus Heresy. The Death Guard were doing great, but they were ruined by a man called Typhon. As the Death Guard prepared to travel, he killed all the astropaths, claiming that they were loyal to the Emperor, but instead he would use his librarians to navigate. He shot them right into the warp and right into the lap of good old Papa Nurgle, who rewarded him with demonic blessings, turning him into Typhus and plaguing the rest of the Legion with disease. The Legion writhed in agony as they were caught in an endless void of, of disease and misery. And the Emp and Papa Nurgle gave Mortarion the Primarch a choice. An eternity of suffering for his Legion or salvation, but service to the Dark Gods. And Mortarion agreed. It ended their suffering, but it did not fix their ruined bodies, and they would stay disgusting tomes of maggot and disease, and they, they were nurgly. It was pretty sad and pretty gross. The tragedy of the Death Guard is that although a lot of the traitor legions fell to chaos based on their own flaws and their own shortfalls, the Death Guard were more or less tricked, and it really is a sad tale. But the, their, their diseased, weird, sticky bodies are kind of cool. Dare I say, hot? Huh? Number 15, the Thousand Sons, led by Magnus, often called Magnus the Red. And unfortunately, they would turn traitor. Once again, a lot like the Death Guard, not necessarily by choice. The Emperor himself named these Marines the Thousand Sons. They were very, very carefully selected. And, after, and once they hit the number 1000, they were set off into the galaxy and they were completely and utterly average. For 10,000 years, they waged average war across the average Great Crusade. Not really anything special about them. But 10 years on in the Great Crusade, all of a sudden, they discovered that they had psychic abilities. This turned them into an incredibly potent and powerful force using the psychic abilities to make themselves even stronger, even more powerful. And everything was going great for them until one day they started to spontaneously generate mutations called the Flesh Change. This didn't happen to everybody, but it was popping up here and there. A Thousand Sun would, start to, would, would succumb to the Flesh Change and be removed from the Legion. And so this thousand marines that had slowly worked its way up to legion status slid back down to 10,000 or to a thousand marines. Things were not looking good for these guys, but then the emperor found Magnus and the legion rejoiced. Magnus was just like them and he was very powerful and they were hoping that this would be an end to the flesh curse. And it sort of was. Although the moment the Emperor departed, tons of them just immediately succumbed to the Flesh Plague. And, and Magnus, through some warpy shenanigans, figured out a way to, to kind of fix his Legion for the most part. And with him and his Legion working together, they became an amazing fighting force. And they went off into the galaxy, and not only did they conquer many planets, but they also went and found libraries, discovered ancient texts. They learned all they could about the warp and about magic. And this didn't sit well with the other legions. In fact, the other legions hated them so much that they called, they called like a, a imperial hearing to decide once and for all if psychic powers were allowed to be used by the Imperium. And it was decided. It was. It was decided in against Magnus's favor. They decided, no, you may not use psychic abilities, and so instantly the Thousand Sons went from an amazing, powerful force with this, you can, you, with this unique ability to back to an average Legion, and it was rough. Magnus, here and there, worked way worked in ways to get away with a little bit of magic, but things things were rough once again for the Thousand Sons. But one day, Magnus discovered Horus's betrayal, and he decided to, to, to use his psychic powers to try to get a message to the Emperor. And if it had worked, it totally would have cut the Horus heresy right off at the head. It would have saved the day. Unfortunately, 
Uh, he just wasn't that good at magic, and it ended up opening a warp rift that let tons of demons pour into the Imperial Palace, and Ol' Emperor was a little pissed. In fact, he was so pissed that he told his Space Wolves to go grab Magnus and bring him, bring him here to explain why he broke his word and used warp magic. But unfortunately, Horus had turned traitor. Nobody, know, nobody had known except Magnus, but Horus was a traitor, and he whispered in the ear of Russ and was like, hey, doesn't Magnus suck? Don't we all hate Magnus? Wouldn't it be great if Magnus died? And so Russ, instead of just going and grabbing Magnus and bringing him to the Emperor, decided to land and destroy Pospero and basically kill Magnus. They, this gleaming, beautiful city of Prospero, this planet, they leveled everything, destroyed everything the Thousand Sons and Magnus had worked for. And as Lehman Russ broke the back of Magnus the Red over his knee, Magnus, in a desperate bid for survival of himself and his legion, pledged his allegiance to Zinch. Zinch instantly saved him and his legion, but unfortunately, it also instantly awokened the long forgotten flesh change and all of his warriors began to change and to distort and deform. And so one more time tragedy befell their legion and a little guy named Aramon came up with a desperate plan to help stop the flesh change in its tracks and he created a spell that did stop it but it also trapped the souls of the Legion in their armor, turning them into automata. All of the Legions that messed around with the demons totally were worse for it. The Thousand Suns were a Legion of real huge peaks and valleys. Things going great, things going very bad. Things going great, things going very bad. But there's a lot to admire about the Thousand Suns. They're a great Legion and they're hot. Number 16, the Sons of Horus, led by Horus Lupercal. And if you can believe it, they turned traitor. Originally known as the Lunar Wolves, the, they were a lot like the Space Wolves. They were a conquering force, a quick, swift strike force. But unlike some of the other legions who were known for furious combats, they were a little bit more disciplined and productive in their stuff. They were noble and ambitious. Alpha Predators focused on ending fights before they became all-out wars. Their style of warfare was the decapitating strike, to hit the enemy command structure and end the war in a single blow. And in this, the Lunar Wolves were incredibly effective and powerful. Horus' legion was arguably the best, most powerful legion. Every legion served a purpose, but Horus's, in terms of a, a warrior culture and a warrior spirit, Horus' legion was the most effective and efficient and best. Horus was the first Primarch to be discovered by the Emperor, and him alongside the Lunar Wolves fought with the Emperor for 13 years. For 13 years, Horus was the Emperor's only son, and that meant he developed a little bit of an only child syndrome. He always wanted to be the best and demanded perfection from himself. This is very apparent in the first few books of the Horus Heresy novel series, where you see Horus really, really struggle with the task given to him by the Emperor. Horus's men were completely devoted to him, and when he decided that it was the best interest of the Imperium to turn traitor and to, de and to dethrone the Emperor, his legion was 100% on board, instantly reorganizing as the Sons of Horus, repainting their armor and preparing for battle. Horus was one of the most popular Primarchs, and his legion one of the most popular Primarchs, with many of the legions working very, very well alongside them. And that's what made it even more tragic at the Dropsite Massacre when his forces turned on some of his closest friends. Oh Horus, Horus Lupercal, you traitor. And the color green isn't that pretty, so not hot. Number 17, the World Bearers, led by Primarch Lorgar Aurelian, turned traitor. If there is a hierarchy of treachery, then the world bearers sit on the highest circle. One of the most devoted and rigorous of warriors, it was not enough that they fell, but that they pulled their brother legions into the abyss with them. Originally known as the Imperial Heralds, they waged an ideological war as well as a physical one. They fought those who opposed the Emperor for religious or ideological reasons, and gave them the option, repent or perish. The way the world bearers waged war was they would send a lone warrior of the 17th, clad in black armor, a herald, 
who would go before the people and give the ultimatum, repent or die. And no matter what they said, then came the 17th, destroying everything and anyone who did not bend the knee to the emperor. And they would leave all of their holy symbols, churches, idols, and religious leaders burning on pyres. The world bearers were zealots, completely loyal to the emperor. So loyal, it was a little problematic, but they believed in the imperial creed. They saw they were fiercely secular. In fact, they were religiously secular and they completely believed in the words of the emperor. But then came Lorgar. Lorgar was a very religious man from a very religious world, and he believed, and perhaps he had a psychic vision, that one day a golden one god would show would show up and take him in take him into the stars. And of course, that happened when the Emperor showed up. When the Emperor showed up, he immediately pledged his fealty and, and was super excited to join his legion and, and perform the Emperor's work in spreading the Imperial Creed. Although Lorgar believed that the Emperor was a god. And even though the Emperor told him in no uncertain words that he was not a god, this just confirmed it in Lorgar's eyes. Because who but a true god would claim he is not a god? In fact, Lorgar wrote the infamous Laetitio Divinatus, the book that would become the official holy text of the 41st millennium. So, hashtag blame Lorgar. And as the war waged on, Lorgar was perhaps a bit quick to throw his brothers into the fray, perhaps whittling down those who believed in the Imperial Creed and replacing them with those who believed in the Imperial cult. Indoctrination, cool, but not hot. World, the world, world, world. Number 18, the Salamanders led by Primarch Vulcan. Very loyal. The Salamanders were known for fighting almost suicidally one-sided battles, to the point where they had a reputation for being very reckless. It was said that they carried the seed of their own destruction in them. They got messed up a lot, but they always came back, but they never made it to full, huge legion size. They were always on the small side. They were made up of men with intelligence, wisdom, and compassion. And that last one was perhaps not an intended trait for the Primarchs or their legions to have. And speaking of the Primarchs, Vulcan was a very good, reasonable, and honorable man. When the Emperor found him, he kind of played a little trick on him. On, the, on his planet Nocturne, every year they would have the trials where the best men would prove themselves. And of course, Vulcan being a Primarch was the best of the best of the best of the best of the best. But the Emperor showed up and completed, competed the trials with Vulcan and was able to go toe to toe with Vulcan and surpass him in every trial. And, but in the moment of triumph, the Emperor and Vulcan found themselves quickly being engulfed by lava fields, and the Emperor actually used his prized catch, the, the greatest salamander that had ever been found on Nocturne, and he threw it into the lava so that he and Vulcan could get to safety. And Vulcan, and even though Vulcan returned with his prize and was, and was praised by his people, he, he bent the knee to this strange old man who, is, who was willing to give up his prize in order to save a life. It was at that moment that the man threw off his cloak and it was the Emperor. And the Vulc Vulcan joined the Emperor in the Great Crusade. Although, uh, you know, similarly to all of the other nice Primarchs, he was very nervous for his people, but the Emperor very reasonably said that being uh, the populace of Nocturne would be the Primarch's homeworld, it would always be safe because it would be under the protection of the Space Marine Legions. And that was very true. When Vulcan rejoined his legion, he found that there was only about 20,000 left. And of course, they were right in the middle of fighting an impossible fight against millions of orcs. But the 18th Legion, ever the good guys, had allowed the evacuation of three planet populations, which although not the most pragmatic decision, was probably very much appreciated by those they rescued. Vulcan arrived with 3,000 fresh recruits brought from Nocturne in the 18th, and boldened by this, fought furiously, every man doing the work of a hundred, and they routed the orcs and found themselves victorious. They met each other and the Salamanders were born. Vulcan loved his Legion, and he made them more disciplined and wiser. He didn't wipe out their old ways either, replacing them with the ways of Nocturne. In fact, he took the best warriors of the Legion and made them his Praetors, his Honor Guard. The Salamanders were as fearless as ever, but now, with their Primarch, they were focused. Total hotties, everyone. Number 19, the Raven Guard, led by their Primarch, Corvus Corax, and of course, they are loyal. The Raven Guard are the sneaky sneakertons of the Horus Heresy genre. 
wearing their black clad armor and, and clothed in the Mark VI armor, which they were testing out at the beginning of the Horus Heresy. And it was considered uh, by some legions to be crap armor, but when given to the Raven Guard, they, they figured out how to put the armor to perfect use, helping them achieve even, help, helping them to be giant eight foot tall super warriors in giant thousand pound metal armor, while still remaining incredibly sneaky. And the famous Beaky Helmet had a heightened olfactory senses, allowing them an excellent sense of smell. And the mask kind of lacking a face with only two glowing eyes definitely was the perfect way to complement the Raven Guard's aesthetic. The way of war for the Raven Guard was to infiltrate into position unseen, study their enemies, and then strike when they were least expecting it. And this proved to be incredibly effective especially when combined with the Lunar Wolves. The Raven Guard often worked alongside Horus, as Horus's drop pods would slam into the ground and his warriors would spill out and begin to wreak havoc. The, the enemy would, of course, falter and retreat, only to find their way blocked by the Raven Guard, who had already been waiting in position ready to strike. Much like the White Scars, the Raven Guard also felt the need for speed, making ample use of air speeders and jump packs. And famously, their Primarch, Conrad Kurz, would fly around the battlefield on his mastercrafted wings. The Raven Guard were an excellent chapter, lauded for their achievements, but unfortunately, they were almost wiped out during the start of the Horus Heresy at the Drop Site Massacre, when the Lunar Wolves, their most trusted allies, turned on them. The Raven Guard are very cool, they're very sneaky, and they're pretty hot. And number 20, the Alpha Legion, led by Alpharius. And of course, they would turn Traitor. The last Legion to meet up with their Primarch, only serving for a few decades before the start of the Heresy. The Legion was known to be secretive in the extreme, favoring cunning ruse and clandestine deployment, and as such, very little is known about their deeds. Their enemies would come under attack before they even realized a threat was coming. Campaigns of infiltration and spreading fear and suspicion. Before they met up with their Primarch, they were known as the Ghost Legion, and they were completely unknown even to the other Primarchs. They would often pretend to be other legions or remove their own heraldry to remain anonymous. These assassination and false flags led by Astartes ended with the discovery of the Primarchs, and it was hypothesized that this Ghost Legion was actually responsible for the corruption of the gene stock of the Emperor's children. Or was it? Basically, every fact known about this legion could end with, or did they? Even before the discovery of their Primarch, there were men claiming to be Alpharius. And once Alpharius was discovered, it was discovered that they were twin Primarchs, Alpharius and Omegon. Completely identical, they both took up the task sharing Primarchship of the newly, newly realized Alpha Legion. And to add even more mystery to their already huge bag of mysteriousness, they seemed to spring into the galaxy fully formed as nobody knew exactly about the Ghost Legion. The Alpha Legion continued to campaign in their way of infiltration and spreading fear and suspicion, and this did take a long time. On occasion, Gilliman chastised them for saying that the war could have been fought quicker through traditional means, to which one of the Alpharia stated that that would have been far too easy. Alpharius and Omegon continued to operate within their legion, often sending emissaries or perhaps showing up in person to help other chapters, as some figure would always show up claiming to be Alpharius. But no one was ever quite sure who the real Alpharius was. Very spooky, very sneaky, and very sexy. Total hotties. That is all 18 legions. Basically, any idea of warrior you can imagine, they existed as a legion. And if none of these legions interest you, you can do whatever you want. <gasps> but Che, it's a historical. Don't you have any respect for the lore or the fans? The legions were massive, hundreds of thousands of Marines, and there was a lot of wiggle room for making your 40 guys your own. The key is not being dogmatic about it, but be creative. Perhaps your Marines were part of a splinter campaign for the White Scars on the fringes of space that didn't meet up with Jacket Icon and so never formally changed over from being known as the Star Hunters or a group of Ultramarines who have included the heraldry of a particularly fierce campaign. You can remain within the lore and still make things your own. Real talk, all the legions are the same. They're all the best fighters, the best warriors, and they all use the same equipment, vehicles, armor marks, and weapons of the Imperium. The reason to pick one legion over another is their personality, who they are as people, 
Those are the qualities that will inform you on what you want to collect, how you want to paint them, and how you're going to convert them. And don't let anything I say sway your decision away from any Legion. If you like one, go for it. Get into their lore, their heraldry, read about their Primarch, get inspired, because all the Legions are cool. <sighs> Even Ultramarines. Thanks for watching.